Hello, everyone. Welcome to History Cafe. Uh, this is a free lecture series that we offer um, on the third Thursday of every month. History Cafe is a joint effort between MOHI, KCTS9, the Seattle Public Library, and HistoryLink.org. Each program is filmed by KCTS9 and is available to view online um, shortly after, after the actual program. So on February 14th, a new exhibit opened here at MOHI in our community gallery, and the revealing queer exhibit seeks to explore the last 40 years of Puget Sound's LGBTQ community's history. Tonight, we are going to look at some of the ways in which the queer community is documenting, documenting, it, documenting its history, and our presenters include Aaron Bailey, the curator of Revealing Queer and the moderator for this evening, Adrian Levitt and Slavin, the co-artistic directors of Number One Must Have Zine, and Larry Knopp, a member of the Northwest Lesbian and Gay History Museum Project and professor of Interdisciplinary Arts and Sciences, Geography, and Gender, Women, and Sexuality Studies at the University of Washington. <laughs> so please join me in welcoming our presenters. Hello, and thank you, Maris, for the, introducing all of us. We are all really thrilled to be here tonight. Um, and thank you so much to KCTS, the Seattle Public Library, MOHI, the panelists, people who love Revealing Queer, and everybody who's had any contribution to the Revealing Queer process as well. We wouldn't be here without the work of all of the communities that support this project. So thank you to all of them. Um, and as Marin Maris mentioned, my name is Erin Bailey, and I am the curator of Revealing Queer, which is upstairs at MOHI. And um, I want to kind of set the context for this conversation tonight. This History Cafe um, won't be an in-depth look into the nuances of LGBTQ history as it has been experienced, but it's more a look at how community-driven historical research happens, how community-driven projects write these narratives into the archive, and how community work actually creates the content that allows institutions to tell these stories. The work of all, th all four of us up here um, reflect that and embody that in all of the practices that we do. Um, and before we move on to the rest of the conversation, I'm gonna briefly talk about the exhibition as well as the Queering the Museum project. Um, in addition to acting as the main curator for Revealing Queer, I am also the co-founder of Queering the Museum project. And that is a practice-based research project that explores how museums can engage with marginalized communities, specifically LGBTQ communities, in their representation, collection, and preservation of histories, culture, artistic practice, community, narratives, um, and so on and so forth. The, the goal of QTM, as we call it, is to look at how museums can engage these communities equitably, how we can build the archive and methodologies that practitioners in the field can apply to their work to be more inclusive and um, equitable to those who are otherwise omitted from many archives that exist in the world. Um, and so basically QTM started in 2011. Um, while I was in graduate school, and we did a few years, uh, or a couple of years of research, outreach, as well as um, programs to build a following, if you will, and this following allowed us to develop a community advisory committee um, to curate the exhibition. Now, our community advisory committee model differs from the typical approach to cura curating exhibitions because it allows the community members to actually develop the content, write the text, ensure that the narrative reflects the experiences that they experienced, as well as the experience of those that they love and know, as well as connecting us with objects that are not in archives that are housed by institutions like MOHI, what we call community collections. This approach has been used several times throughout the, the world now, and it was actually coined by the Wing Luke uh, Museum here in Seattle. And we adopted this model that they developed, did, queered it, if you will, to meet the needs of the LGBTQ community because it's, it's a little bit different, and it, it needs to be a little bit different to serve the communities that we want it to serve. So it's really important that we both respect what the wing has done to develop this model, as well as acknowledging the fact that we changed it a little bit to make sure that we could move f as far away from expectations and stereotypes, as well as um, common assumptions made about around communities. Um, and. The Community Advisory Committee is comprised of a dozen LGBTQ organizations throughout the Puget Sound region. We were really intentional to make sure that we included Seattle, Tacoma, and Olympia as much as we possibly could in the exhibition. And uh, the 
community advisory committee members are for any, everyone from Entre Hermanos to Gay City Health Project to the Northwest Lesbian and Gay History Museum Project, Queer Youth Space, Old Lesbians Organizing for Change, and I'm leaving off very important ones as well. Um, the whole list of them is up in the exhibition space, and I'm happy to talk to you about the role of each of these organizations in the process as well. Um, but the exhibition itself, let's get into the nitty gritty of it before we move on to how other people have collected their history, is that the exhibition, as Mara said, explores the last 40 years of LGBTQ history. Pretty lofty task for a thousand square foot gallery. It's not a lot of space to tell a ton of history. And there hasn't been a regional history museum in Washington state that has addressed this topic before. There have been some auxiliary topics that exist um, in other institutions. Um, the Wing had a, a queer exhibition on API, Asian Pacific Islander Experiences, in 2007. Uh, the Northwest Lesbian Gay History Museum Project has hosted exhibitions around town, but none of them existed inside of an institution, a museum proper. And so it's really quite impressive that Mohai did this and allowed us to decide what themes we wanted to engage in the exhibition. And so we picked five broad themes, um, we as in the Community Advisory Committee, and the themes we picked were language, because not everybody knows what LGBTQ stands for, which is pretty important to kind of equitably talk about this, this topic, to know what you're talking about. We also talked about lived experiences, so that we could really identify some key and interesting and diverse experiences that exist within the LGBTQ community, so that we don't continue um, putting the same experiences to the top, but really to show the breadth of those who identify as LGBTQ. We talked about spaces and places, spaces for activism, youth resources, community resources, spaces that have been claimed or were developed intentionally to be queer spaces that allowed these communities to gain momentum, to have a place to exist, as well as to heal. Um, we also talk about celebrations, and this is not just pride, although pride is very, very popular and very predominant and, and um, is, is critical in thinking about LGBTQ experiences, but we celebrate in a variety of ways outside of pride. And so the exhibition touches on a few of those topics as well so that we can move past the idea that um, once a year we get to come out of our, our queer caves and put on a boa and have a really great time with all of our friends, but that we do this all year long. We have film festivals, we have spaces, we have events, and it's really important to remind ourselves of that as well. And the last thing that we talk about is regional law and policy. And we talk about the changes that have happened in the last 40 years in Seattle that have led to um, the human rights campaign that is working now to support equity within LGBTQ experiences and how progressive Seattle was at a time when these things were happening. And so within that, uh, within the um, the context of all of those experiences and, and topics within the exhibition, we call out a few things that really allow us to build... Bridges is not a metaphor I like right now, <laughs> dealing with my language around that, because a bridge is a, is a two-way. Whereas what we really did is we created a web of connections and a web of ways to think about how we engage with LGBTQ history. For example, we in our lived experiences section, we talk about Jim Gaylord. Jim Gaylord was a teacher down in Tacoma who was fired in the 70s because through one way or another, came out to his, um, his superiors and was eventually terminated because of it. Not because he did something wrong or because he was a bad teacher, but specifically because he came out as gay. This all happened simultaneously when the Tacoma School District was adopting an uh, anti-bigotry policy, and an anti-discrimination policy that, that called for people to put an end to bullying, to put an end to harassment, to put a, an end to pejorative language used in the schools by Apparently they only expected the students to do that. But all while Jim was losing his position, and he was a revered teacher in Tacoma, this anti-bigotry campaign came out at Tacoma School District. So it's really kind of interesting to think about how the oppression happened and how, how deep homophobia was less than 40 years ago. I mean, it's many of our lifetimes were, it happened in our lifetimes. It's incredible to think about that. And in addition to that, um, this talking about things like Jim Gaylord allows us to move past the isolation that people put around LGBTQ. It's not just a singular identity or a singular experience, but one that permeates lots of other identities. You can't just be you know, a lesbian or a gay man. You're also a teacher or a scholar or an athlete, et cetera, et cetera. So it really kind of helps us understand the complexities of identity, especially when we think about LGBTQ identities here in Seattle. And um, we hope that this will allow for a deeper understanding of um, all the identities that intersect with LGBTQ. We also, um, talked about the regional law and policy section, which I like to draw attention to because I think it's really important for us to look at the regional law and policies that have happened over the last 40 years and 
compare that to what happened nationally to really show how progressive Seattle was at the start of the timeline of this exhibition specifically to kind of allow us to understand how Seattle became the progressive city it's become known as today. And it's really because of early activism, early um, radical thinking, and um, early communities, specifically LGBTQ communities who were fighting to have a place at the table. We're fighting to live safely and equitably in their own communities, to not be fired or to lose their homes or to have their children taken away because they identify as LGBTQ. And so when you compare the national narrative or the national timeline of changes and the, the human rights slash gay rights movement, you also can see how far ahead Seattle was. And we hope that this will allow for us people, for people to realize that apathy is just is not, is not acceptable still. Just because we have marriage equality doesn't mean that everything is solved. Doesn't mean there aren't still things that oppress and hurt and um, make people feel isolated. And that's something that we really wanted to drive home with the exhibition as well. Um, and all of this work is meant to start a conversation in, a cul in one of our cultural institutions, Mohai, around these topics. It's not meant to be all-encompassing. It does not cover all of the history that is left to be told by any means. And it really is meant to start a conversation of how communities can reclaim their voices and how communities can put the power that they have into the institution to claim not, not only their identity, but their role and the role of their forebears, if you will, in shaping the, the society that we live in today. So with all of that said, and kind of an understanding of what, we, what I do and what the exhibition is trying to do, the panel is going to continue this conversation of talking about how communities work to to claim their own histories, and then by working with institutions, allow for everybody to have a better understanding of these identities and experiences and histories. And I think it's really important for us to remember that without the community, we wouldn't be here today. We wouldn't have exhibitions. We wouldn't have we wouldn't have histories that were claimed. We wouldn't have anything. We would just be isolated people walking around in jeans, which is, sounds fun, but the communities and the healing that it happens therein is really important. So. Um, and while this exhibition doesn't talk specifically about the nuances of LGBTQ history, I am happy to talk shop with anybody here after and getting into some really some interesting things and hopefully learning a few things about s things that happened before I was born. So without further ado, I would like to call Larry Knopp up here to continue this conversation of community histories <laughs> and collecting and preserving um, our narratives. So please help me welcome Larry. Thanks, Aaron. That's loud. Um, just a minute, I'm gonna get situated here. I need glasses. <clears throat> so thanks, Aaron. Uh, thanks, co-panelists. Thank everybody for coming. Thanks to all the sponsors and to Mohai in particular. Um, it's been a great privilege uh, and an honor to be involved with Revealing Queer and an equally uh, great honor to be invited to come and speak here tonight. So I'm wearing really two hats tonight. Uh, one is as a member of the Northwest Lesbian and Gay History Museum Project, uh, and the other is as an academic. Both of those roles uh, are terribly important in terms of uh, my and the Northwest Lesbian and Gay History Museum Project's uh, participation in the Revealing Queer exhibit. Let me just talk about both of those roles really briefly. Um, the Northwest Lesbian and Gay History Museum Project, for people who don't know, is an all volunteer, and I stress that, all volunteer, all volunteer, a uh, relatively small group of committed people who are interested in preserving and disseminating knowledge about the history of the local and regional uh, LGBTQ communities. In fact, the mission statement of the Northwest Lesbian and Gay History Museum Project reads as follows. Uh, NWL, NWLGHMP, or the History Project, founded in 1994, is an organization which researches, interprets, and communicates the history of lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender people in the Pacific Northwest for the purposes of study, education, and enjoyment. Recognizing that the history of this vibrant community has been sparsely and inaccurately recorded, the History Project seeks to collect oral histories, locate photographs, ephemera, objects, and documents, and work with archives to ensure the preservation of these materials, and create public programs such as exhibits, publications, and presentations to communicate the collective experience we have uncovered. That's really a broad mission 
uh, and a huge mission for an all-volunteer uh, organization. I want you to notice the similarities to the mission of a university and an academic. Um, the mission of most academic institutions is to advance and disseminate knowledge through scholarship, teaching, and service to professions and communities. Now, in my case, I'm a geographer. I'm an academic geographer by training, and my primary specialization, it's not my only specialization, but my primary specialization is queer geography, which really has to do with exploring the significance of space, place, and environment in human social life, specifically as it relates to non-normative sexualities, genders, and other axes of difference. So through that role as an academic, and I work, by the way, very closely in collaboration with other geographers, one in particular, Professor Michael Brown in the Department of Geography at the University of Washington, uh, and together we have uh, really kind of pushed the space place angle uh, in revealing queer and, uh, and other forums. And, we, and within the Northwest Lesbian and Gay History Museum project, we have worked with other uh, volunteers to create things such as this uh, a map called Claiming Space, Seattle's Lesbian and Gay Historical Geography. It's a fold-out glossy thing. I have some copies over here that people can look at, and they are available for purchase. But you get a sense of um, what we're trying to illustrate with this. this artifact. I'm not going to try and, uh, no, nah, it's okay. I can, I can pass, there are some here that we can pass around, but I just wanted to give you a sense of that. So we're very interested in uh, highlighting spaces and places, hence that particular theme in the, thank you, in, in the Revealing Queer exhibit. Uh, the Northwest Lesbian and Gay History Museum project also has produced, uh, has collected numerous uh, oral histories. And uh, in 2002, this was produced in 2004, the map was, we, we self-published excerpts from uh, a subset of those oral histories called uh, Mosaic One, Life Stories from Isolation to Community, Oral History from the Northwest Lesbian and Gay History Museum Project. Um, so these are some of the things that we produce, um, but what I want to spend the rest of my time talking about, and I'll just take a few minutes to do this, are some of the problems and issues that are involved in doing this kind of work. They are many. And I'm going to focus really just on one subset of issues, and those are political issues. This kind of work, recovering history, representing experiences, representing geographies, is inherently political. Um, it's political in many senses, including one, the obvious one, because it challenges the status quo and dominant narratives about history and geography and how the world works. But it's also political because the work itself and what's produced from it is a form of representation. Whenever we try to represent something, whether we are poets or whether we are historians or geographers or cartographers or, or storytellers, um, we inevitably have to make choices about what stories we're going to tell, whose stories we're going to tell, what geographies we're going to emphasize, what geographies we are not going to uh, illustrate. And in so doing, we empower and reproduce certain truths, because there are many truths, and we marginalize others. This is an inevitable, I'm, I'm, I'm sure not telling a lot of people anything that they don't already know, but we tend to forget that there's not a single truth out there that's, that's, that's just waiting to be found and represented. There are multiple truths that reflect different interests and experiences, and it is essentially impossible in any particular artifact or form of representation to represent all of them, or even the ones that you do represent fairly, at least from some folks' perspectives. So in collecting, for example, oral histories, there's always a negotiation and even a contestation around what the stories are that you're going to tell through narratives, maps, exhibits, collections, and so forth. I'm just going to give you three quick examples. One comes from the Revealing Queer exhibit itself, which I think is fabulous. I think it's wonderful. I think that as a member of the Community Advisory Council, I think that you know, we all deserve a pat on the back. I think we did a great job. But 
it is still a political product. Um, and to just take a couple of, well, well, one particular example. We did discuss on the committee the challenge of representing the issue not so much of sexuality or sexual identity, but sex, sex itself, in the exhibit. It is in fact true that for many people in this region, that community was built particularly prior to the Stonewall Rebellion and the movements, of the, the gay rights movement of the 70s and so forth, that a lot of community was built in the context of and through people pursuing sex in all kinds of venues, some of them not by, by contemporary standards, not necessarily real pretty. So people cruising for sex, people finding places in which they could meet other people first for sex and then out of that grew community. Well, it's not that, that a conscious decision was made to exclude that from the exhibit, but um, just as a product of collective process and decision making and prioritizing about these various themes, if you look at that exhibit, I think you'll see that you have to look pretty hard to find it. I don't think that's an accident. That's just an artifact of the way the politics of these sorts of projects go forward. Another example has to do with that map that I showed you. That map debuted at Pride in 2002. <laughs> Thank you, Aaron. Um, in Volunteer Park. And we invited people to comment on it, just as Revealing Queer is inviting comments. And not surprisingly, we got lots of comments that said, why isn't this on the map? You put this in the wrong place. This is misrepresented. This is inaccurate. I disagree with this. I disagree with that. And that's wonderful. Um, but what that points out is that the, pro the project of producing the map was a collective one. And what came out of it reflected, A, who was at the table at the conversations. B, the strength of their arguments and persuasiveness and sort of arguing for particular sites or locations to be on the map. C, a sort of collective evaluation of those, uh, those arguments to create a prior to prioritization. Um, D, the quality of the outreach that those of us in the room made to folks who weren't part of the group making the map. And on and on, there's a whole set of uh, explanations for why the map is a snapshot of a particular imagination that came out of, a, out of a collective process at a particular moment. That's inevitable. So I'm not apologizing for the map. I'm just explaining it is always an inevitably a partial <coughs> representation and a non-neutral representation. Uh, lastly is the production of Mosaic One. Uh, and that is that decisions had to be made about how about which oral histories to choose and um, which ones sort of were representative, which ones were crucial, what absolutely had to be told and what was expendable. And again, that was a product of a collective process of decision making that reflected who was at the table. So sort of the, the takeaway from this is that queer representations, whether historical, geographical, artistic or otherwise, are always partial, they're always negotiated, they're always contested, and they're always in flux. Knowing that's one thing, developing creative ways to deal with it and to become ever more inclusive is another. Hence, new ideas are welcome, for example, digital forms of representation that allow input and constant updating of uh, archives and so forth. And I would imagine that in conversation we'll talk about others. So. That's it for me. Thank you.
So the question on the floor right now is talking about what makes it into the archive, how we make these political decisions of what we archive, and then how we equitably engage with acknowledging those who have been collected or archived for reasons outside of their sexuality and how we engage with that. And I think that that, how we out people historically, is a really, really political topic and builds nicely off of what Larry said. So taking just a few seconds before we get into Adrian and Slavin's conversation to talk about that, is it's very difficult because not everybody wanted to be out. It was a time when there was no history, arguably, in the archive. So how do we go back and say, Walt Whitman was gay? It's really difficult to do these sorts of things, and it's really something that the field of history, as well as museums and archives, are kind of navigating right now. There's folks on one side of the spectrum who feel that if there's any sort of inclination or reference or slight evidence to support the idea that someone was gay, and it's okay to just out them. There are other people who feel very strongly that you can't go back in history and make these associations with folks who may or may not have been out, and the same is true now. Um, just the other day, Ellen Page came out as a lesbian, I think is how she identifies, I hope. My, the point in referencing that is that she has been rumored to be out for years, and everyone in the community was like, well, duh, obviously Ellen Page is a lesbian, duh. But no one knew that, and it was until she claimed that for herself, it's not fair for us to place these labels on people, so it's a really fine line we have to walk. And that's, uh, speaking into the politics of the Revealing Queer exhibition, it's one reason that we went back to 73 and didn't try to go back to 1850 and make any claims about Sarah Gessler and her um, alleged affair with a, a woman in 1860s-ish time period because it's, it's a really difficult topic to address and it's really hard to do that equitably. So I think that we're still kind of um, engaging in that and if Larry, if you have things to chime in, please feel free. Yeah, I, just, I, just, I just wanted to say that, that um, the History Project does occasionally do walking tours of Pioneer Square in which we are sort of highlighting the, the history of what was, um, the, the fact that the gay community, uh, its first sort of spatial center was Pioneer Square, not Capitol Hill, and what life was like in that environment and what even gay identity meant at that time. And so um, one, of the, one of the ways in which you address that in hindsight is to try and make visible what was impossible to be visible at another time. One more question and then we'll get to Adrian and Slavin. I think the University of Washington is very lucky that it has this very noisy uh, collection. I, mm -hmm. think you're familiar I am. Which documents the early days of the Dorian Society. Mm -hmm. So um, the, this gentleman mentioned that UW has a Tim Mayhew collection, which is um, labeled as an LGBTQ collection, and what you might not know about collecting archive or collecting histories and, uh, and artifacts is that there's a whole process for which they're categorized and labeled and, and recorded so that you can go back and find them is the point. However, with an LGBTQ artifacts and objects, getting to the point of who was out and who was not out historically, these objects can can get lost in the shuffle, and if they're not um, labeled as LGBTQ from the get go then it's very hard to go back into the archive and refine them. And even with UW, which has a growing LGBTQ um, collection, both manuscripts as well as photo photographs and um, not so many objects. They have a few buttons that I was surprised to find in an archival box, but they were there. Um, they're not all processed yet. Many people from the community said, hey, I gave all of my papers to UW five years ago. Did you find them? And I was like, what, what's your name? No. They didn't come up in my finding aids. It didn't come up from anybody who knew that because it's still being processed. So the funding behind it to get these things actually accessible by the public is really lagged because there's not enough scholars in the world that can, art that can articulate these things um, equitably. There's not enough funding to support the processing of, of these objects. And also, it depends on the institution, how they address the topic, how their staff understands LGBTQ identities, histories, and the complexities they're in. And fortunately, here at Mohai, we, when, a br when coming to them with the proposal um, to do this topic, they were receptive. They had some questions like, why queer? Like, why are you using that word? Isn't it pejorative? And so we had a lot of negotiations around that. Um, also, my identity as a person came up pretty quickly in regards to the authority I had to tell this topic. And of course, while I'm not in the closet in any capacity, I, was, I refused to comment on that because my authority as, a, as an LGBTQ person does not indicate my ability to do historical research. 
my ability to understand. While it does offer personal perspectives that allow me to, to get there faster, I don't think that it prevents me from talking about these things equitably. And if we only allow people who are LGBTQ to talk about these topics in the museum, museums across the country aren't gonna be able to talk about it because they don't have queers on staff to do this work. So we have to find a way that we can engage these topics beyond our personal connections in a way to kind of allow people to understand the complexities of these topics so that people who are allies or scholars or looking to find the hidden histories of Pioneer Square and then happen to stumble upon LGBTQ things can talk about it equitably. And I think through public um, presentations such as this, exhibitions upstairs as well as the growing archive of both Mohai and UW, the collection of the um, the History Project, Washington State Historical Society, et cetera, et cetera, will allow us to ha continue to have these conversations and dig deeper into these topics as well. So thinking about how we go around collecting our histories and collecting the stories of those who identify in a variety of ways, I'm really excited to bring up um, Adrian and Slavin. They both are um, have been working on the number one must-have zine for um, ever since I've known them, and they've shown across the country in museums um, talking about portraits of LGBTQ folks in the Puget Sound region, and they'll get into all of the details of the amazing work that they're doing, but the, his the work that they're doing has is also featured in the exhibition and allows us to have a narrative and a physical, tangible way to think about people today who identify a certain way or live as a part of this community or have impacted us in some way or another. So it's really important to think about these things. So I hope you'll all join me in welcoming both Adrian and Slavin to the podium. Hi everyone, thank you so much for being here. Um, I'm Slavin, as, as Aaron mentioned. Uh, co-creator of the number one must-have zine and project. And also, kind of briefly back to your question, as a librarian, um, I think that there's a certain element of collection development or archiving materials that's just censorship. Uh, and that's kind of what they were saying, but it's, it's what you choose to put in a collection and what you choose to not put in it or how you choose to tag information or, or catalog it. It's, it's essentially censorship, so I'm, I guess I'm not too surprised that there wasn't too much in that archive, even though it's, it's sad, um, but uh, that kind of makes sense to me. That was a neat question. So, who are you? Oh, um, my name's Adrian, um, and I'm the other uh, co-producer and creator of uh, Number One Must Have, which is a photography zine project. I'll let Slavin tell us all a little more about what's happening on the screen. Yeah, so the, the project is um, all narrative, portraiture, I have a difficult time with that word, uh, photography. The photos are taken by Adrian and they're amazing. Uh, so we, we kind of chose to uh, uh, collect images of people without text explaining who they were or why we were taking their photo. We just really wanted the pictures to tell the story. Because there are a lot of uh, publications and projects and things out there that do a good job of letting people tell their stories and I mean, there can always be more, but it's, it, we just felt like that was out there. Um, there are zines like Original Plumbing that we were inspired by, which is a, a trans guy zine based in New York. Um, there's Butt Magazine, which is inspiring in many ways. Uh, what other projects? Uh, there's some other things, but we just kind of wanted to take photos and have those tell the story. So that's what we're seeing as we're going to talk up here. So um, uh, this project began long before it was a photography project and a historical project about capturing uh, queer people, uh, mostly queer people in Seattle, but it began um, when Slavin and I um, ran, run a night called Lick. And Lick is a dance night. It's a queer club night. It happens every month um, at Chop Suey, which is not historically a queer venue on Capitol Hill. It was started by a friend of ours about nine years ago. Um, it was on Thursday nights about every month, and um, nine years ago, about 100 people would come and dance and hang out and have this space that wasn't normally ours um, for the evening. And it has grown in many ways. Um, it's still a monthly night. We do it on Saturday nights now, which um, and about 700 people come every time we do pride parties and New Year's parties, and it's a way for us to facilitate our queer community, many queer communities to come together, again, not in a space that's normally for queer people, 
and have fun and um, have fun in a radical way and a political way where we can enjoy each other and our community. It involves many different performers and artists. Um, we work with The Satisfaction, which is a lo local queer hip hop group. Um, ben De La Creme, who is um, now on RuPaul's Drag Race, which is a really popular television show I hear, and um, which I've never seen, but that's okay. So, um, and we also have had lots of benefit projects where we've donated money to Queer Youth Space um, and uh, Bent, which is a queer writing institute. And Lick has really been um, our way of creating and facilitating our queer community on Capitol Hill in a way that feels uh, again, fun, and, and that can be a really revolutionary act. Yeah, we've worked really hard with the, the, the staff at Chop Suey to create kind of a safe space, uh, as safe as possible. I mean, safe is certainly relative, but we've, we've just tried to really kind of create a space that is, is welcoming to many different kinds of people. Um, and the relevance of bar culture is, is definitely... Um, it, uh, part of the Revealing Queer exhibit, um, and definitely part of queer history and queer present. Um, so we, we kind of wanted to figure out a way to honor that in a more tangible way and create kind of a historical artifact. Um, but we also wanted to take the kind of love and community and, and fun and celebration that was felt at Lick and, and bring it out of the club and not just have it be this thing that only happened in a bar. How can we, we, we wanted to try to figure out how we could represent that differently or, um, or complementary. Um, so we, we decided to start this zine and we, we very, from the start, we really, really wanted to have a physical publication. Um, we have some with us here today. If you wanna see them, we have five issues uh, because we felt like that, that artifact was really important. Having a thing that you could hold and look at and share with people and leave on your coffee table send to your friend in the Midwest. Um, <laughs> Kyle's a babe, right? <laughs> um, reading boots of leather, slippers of gold. Uh, <laughs> uh, so we just wanted to kind of figure out how to capture that and, and specifically capture it in something that would become an artifact. At the same time, we, we, we also maintain an online presence that Adrian will talk about a little bit more. Um, I just want to quickly speak to the name, number one must have. Uh, both Adrian and I are really big music fans, um, really big feminists, also gay. So uh, we, we kind of wanted to figure out something that represented our shared interests. Um, and we're big Slater Kinney fans. There's a song called Number One Must Have that came out in the mid, well, I guess the late 90s, maybe the early 2000s, I can't remember. But anyway, the song Number One Must Have basically talks about the commodifi commodification of riot girl culture and, and um, consumption as identity. You know, you become your credit cards. You become this girl power thing that you can buy somewhere. Um, so we just thought that it was neat to represent our community and our, uh, this project as Number One Must Have being th this, us, who we are, how we represent ourselves and not just this thing that you buy or is about consumption or, or whatever. I, I don't know, I could explain it better sometime, but um, <laughs> so that's where the name comes from. So we have um, physical printed zines um, as well as an online presence on Tumblr and Tumblr is like a blog platform, this proprietary, I guess. Um, and it's uh, really popular among young people um, which I think we've learned a lot about. Certainly people, youth, is a really popular medium for them to find images that they relate to and then interact with people in that way. So that felt like a really important medium for us um, to maintain and we've specifically kept certain photographs online and then certain photographs that you can only see in the print image because both Slavin and I, um, certainly Slavin as a librarian and me as a person that enjoys media, I suppose that um, to have something that is actually physically tangible that you get to look at is very exciting. So our print scenes have been distributed um, through us online and then as well as through um, certain bookstores and also at Babeland um, in Seattle and New York. And we've also had the opportunity to have um, many different art shows. We've had some art shows in town um, and our art shows have really culminated with an art show we had at the Leslie Loem Museum of Gay and Lesbian Art, which is in New York City in Soho. Um, and we had the opportunity to print very large banners of our images that probably about floor to ceiling that hung outward on a street in Manhattan. So when you walked 
past this really extraordinary museum in New York, our images were in their windows and they were huge and they were these communities in Seattle and for me and I think for Slavin is the people making the, the images, they were people that we had had these like really intimate experiences with because to take someone's portrait is a really intimate experience and to see them in these huge forms looking down at New York was, um, it was a very powerful moment and we, it felt like uh, we got to bring our Seattle communities, although we've shot photos outside of Seattle, the vast majority of the photos in the project are from Seattle. Um, you can see Seattle in the background in this one. Uh, to, to bring that to New York and to show New York City, this is our really amazing and powerful and diverse queer community was a, was a really interesting experience. And actually we took this photograph in New York while we were there. We um, both went out for a, a really amazing reception and, and got to meet some queer people in New York that had uh, felt a connection with our project and that was very powerful. Yeah, and a another neat thing about the show in New York, uh, because it was a, a storefront gallery, people didn't have to go into a museum or a gallery. They, you know, it, w it was so accessible because it was right there on the street, which was kind of a power powerful thing too, because not everybody feels comfortable in those spaces. Um, and also people who maybe didn't want to see it had to see it all the time. <laughs> and that's the <laughs> best, so. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, not only did we get to meet a lot of great people through that show and through taking photos of people and, and, and just things like this, uh, we've heard stories from, from people who've bought the zine or seen it in places and, and how it affected them. Uh, Adrian has a, a, a law school buddy who has a queer daughter who's in her teens, um, living on one of the islands, feeling pretty isolated, feeling like a weirdo. Uh, I think she's genderqueer or uh, very aware of her queerness um, and also a teenager, so it's just rough. Um, and she was looking at one of our zines and saw a photo of Ben de la Creme shopping for cereal at the IGA. Like, it's a really powerful image. It's colorful, it's beautiful. Ben is amazing. Um, and this queer kid said to her mom, like, something like, uh, wow, this person buys cereal just like me, you know? And, and just kind of really identified with that, which is, which is really neat. Um, so so we've, we've just, we've grown so much and learned so much from this project. I think, um, is this me or? I was going to say one thing before you say that. Yeah, great. Um, so this, the goal of the project is really about queer visibility, um, reframing, uh, our queer experience outside of the paradigm that we're used to seeing and then celebrating a lot of diverse queer cultures as you can see in the images. Um, and I don't think this was our intention at the outset but certainly as this project has gone on for a number of years and we've collected a, a substantial amount of images, um, it's also really become a historical piece, a piece that can talk not by individual images but by them as together and through themes um, can talk about what it means to be queer during this time, what it means to be queer in Seattle, what it means to be able to be queer and express ourselves in different ways. And in that sense, um, I, I think that being involved in this project has really allowed Slavin and I to think and talk more about how this has become a historical project about queerness in Seattle during the times that we've been um, photographing people here. Yeah, and uh, I think something that's really neat about it too is that the project's not about um, passivity. How do you say that word? Not being passive. That it's not. It's not a passive project. This is. It's powerful. These. Pe these are people who pick places where they want their photos taken because it means something to them, or they want to dress up in an amazing outfit and walk around Pike Place Market and change their clothes in different um, little coves, alcoves in the market. Um, so it's. It's not a passive project. You know, we're not waiting for it to get better. We're. We're making it happen. Y and and that. That's a really important part of this too. Um, and also Seattle is a subject in a lot of the photos. It's almost like it's its own character. So it's, it's the, the context of the city is really important um, and, and kind of the history and, and us making the town ours and, and making, making private spaces in public, which is a super queer thing to do and something we've always had to do. So it's, you know, it's having it's doing whatever you want in the market. It's going into the grocery store and taking up a lot of space. It's uh, um, doing mammograms on Pike Street and your big pink thing, pink, pink, pink uh, Winnebago in front of the Wild Rose Dyke Bar. It's, 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 it's Seattle is also a really, impart, a, a really important part. It's, it's a subject in itself, so. Yeah. 
Um, yeah, I'm going to say one more thing. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, the image that we have in the project is of Shelley Brothers, who's um, the owner of the Wild Rose, which is um, Seattle's lesbian bar. And um, taking her photo, uh, which is, ups I don't know if it's in the slideshow, but it's definitely upstairs, was really powerful because she's such an important person and the Wild Rose is such an important venue in Seattle for our queer community and our queer history. And I think that that image um, is a perfect one to be involved in this project uh, because it represents our project. It represents spending time with Shelley, who's someone we both happen to know personally, spending time in the Wild Rose, this really important space, and then acknowledging the Wild Rose for what it is, which which is Seattle's only lesbian bar and one that's been around for a long time and that's really important to our community. And, and Shelly hates to have her photo taken. <laughs> so it was such a sweet, vulnerable thing that she let us do that. She didn't even say no. She didn't even try to say no. She just said, okay. And then we took her photo and it, it was amazing. So it was a really neat thing for all of us. I think that's all we have. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. So thank you so much, Adrian and Slavin, for talking about it. Um, and it is really hard to find a picture of Shelley. That's a true story. I was like, wh where can I get this? And then I remember these lovely people sitting next to me. I was like, well, duh. It's an obvious connection. And, um, and some things that I really like about, to kind of recap everything that everyone said tonight, some things that are really similar in all the work that we've done um, as you know, individuals and as collectives is that every single person in this panel has done a collective project. Um, they, these two here work together. Larry's a part of the All Volunteer uh, History Project. I co-created Queen the Museum Project with Nicole Robert. All of this is embodying community. None of us are trying to claim it for ourselves. None of us are trying to have the authority of saying this is the queer past or this is the queer experience or this is the right queer portrait or what have you. But it's really embodying that sort of community uh, validation that we're doing this for something else for a bigger cause because we're not waiting for it to get for it to get better we're making it better by doing all these things and i think that's really important to say and i also want to point out another really interesting similarity between all of our work is that we all come from really different backgrounds um, i i do have a history degree um adrian has a lot of background and librarian and a geographer and all of it takes all of us to tell this history not just because I have a, a history degree doesn't mean that my, my research is better or that I have the authority on saying these things. It just means I have the, the academic credentials to talk about these things. But I relied so heavily on all of their research, all of their experiences, all of their knowledges to make sure that the content upstairs reflects the communities that exist in the very interesting character that is Seattle. And I think that's something that's really important to, to think about. Um, so we have about... 10 or 15 minutes or so for questions. So if we would like to start, does anybody out there have anything that they want to ask any of us about any particular project? Um, please feel free, now is the time. In the green shirt. But what's your name also? Uh, Monica. Hi, Monica. Thank you. It was, my, it was my pleasure to put all the effort into it, and I can't stress enough that the Community Advisory Committee was instrumental in making that happen. I literally could not have done anything without them. I had 12 people who, when you sit at a table and you have 12 people around you who are talking about queer history, history that's so important to you, and you realize that they're articulating every single struggle you faced from the time that you realized that you were not straight to the time that you were bold enough to come out to the time that I you know, fell in love for, the, for the, what I hope the last time. They have been through it all. So it's like sitting around a table with the 12 best parents you could ever possibly ask for because they know everything you're gonna go through and they don't care that they're gonna tell you, yeah, sex is rough. Just do what you gotta do, the best you can do, and call it a day. Relationships are gonna be terrible because someone's gonna cheat, you're gonna get your heart broken, and the politics are always gonna suck. They're never gonna get better. But if you keep doing small changes and keep living a certain way, you'll make it. And it's really important, this is Shelly also, just to point that out. So it, it, so it became not only um, great for the institution, but I grew so much. And I feel like my parents are great, don't get me wrong, they're great folks. But having the 12 of them sit around and encourage me and tell me that I'm doing something that they're proud of changed me as a person. And that's just, that's just real, real talk.
So thank you for coming to the opening and thank you for liking the exhibition. I'm glad, I'm glad you're here. Any other thoughts, questions? Yeah, in the front. <laughs> thank you. So yeah, so the question is, is Shelley Brotherton of the Wild Rose the same Shelley that opened Shelley's leg? And it's not the same. Both powerful people and great to have around. They are, in fact, different. Um, so Shelley's leg was a really popular disco here in Seattle in the, the 70s, I'll say, a little bit before. And it was the first place that gays and straights, if you will, as they referred to it at the time, could dance together. And they welcomed in the LGBTQ community and their guests. And so it was the first time that it was meant that was a queer space that kind of welcomed in um, LGBTQ folks. And Larry knows so much about Shelley's leg. It's, it's incredible. So if you have anything to, I'm sh he knows more than he, he claims uh, what to. Does, do we want the story of yes. how Shelley, okay. The, how, so how did Shelley lose her leg? Okay. It's so a big story. So Shelley Bauman, by the way, was, was not queer, um, but was a great friend to the uh, queer community. And um, in Bastille Day in the mid-70s sometime, there was a big celebration in Pioneer Square with a cannon. And people kept throwing gum and spit wads into the cannon. And then um, uh, the cannon was lit. And in the course of going off, Shelley lost her leg. Um, <coughs> as a result of that, there was a settlement. With the settlement, Shelley opened Seattle's first, not just queer disco, but disco, period, at the foot of, foot of Maine uh, in Pioneer Square. And it had a, a, a relatively short but quite uh, colorful run and was terribly important in the, um, the minds and imaginations and experiences of a whole generation of queer folk in Seattle. And she died, what, about two years ago? Um, I think she was living on... Bainbridge or the Kitsap Peninsula somewhere, and um, uh, and died, and I think there. I think the Seattle Gay News did a obituary, um, and there at some point I think there may have been some interviews with Shelley too, but she was fairly reclusive. Thanks, Larry, in, in the blue hat. So the question is, is the LRC, which is the Lesbian Resource Center, in the exhibition? And there is. There's a whole section dedicated to the LRC and its value and um, contributions to the community. Of course, um, it could go deeper, as all the topics could, but there are limitations within space, and the political nature of curating allows for some tough decisions to be made. Um, but the LRC was in there, and we have, um, we have a, a bit of their history, as well as some photographs, as well as a softball signed by the uh, LRC softball team because some stereotypes are true. Lesbians <laughs> play softball. It's a fact. And so we have the softball up there as well as an image of um, the team in the 90s as well. And the LRC was really important because it was one of the first spaces in Seattle that was claimed for women, specifically lesbian women. And it allowed um, for people to, to go somewhere to have questions answered. And there's a whole slew of letters that um, were found that were from people um, I think they were found by the History Project, actually. And they were just letters written in saying, I'm a lesbian, I just moved to Seattle, I have no idea what to do. What, how do I, where do I meet people? And how do I deal with the, pol the political nature and the, and the, re the oppression, repression of um, this identity here in Seattle? And so it was really critical for the lesbian community to have that space well before the, Rose, um, the Wild Rose existed. So it was really, really critical to the, the lesbian history here in the region as well. So yes. Yes, in there, yes. So the question on the floor is, how is the trans community represented? And um, really equitably, I think. We worked with Ingersoll Gender Center, which is um, an international facilitator of trans activism. And Marsha Botzer is the um, co-founder and the director of it right now. And they have a whole section where we kind of explore their history, their contribution, and specifically the contribution of Marsha, who is most recently working with China's trans community to help them um, gain visibility, have resources, build a network, kind of overcome some of the oppressions that um, one might face in a communist country, which is arguably a very unique and very specific community, and she's been consulting with them for a couple of years now. And we also have um, 
worked with Marsha pretty extensively on the language section. So when you go upstairs, you'll see a whole section on language that's used within LGBTQ communities, where we explain what LGBTQ stands for, both the good and bad side of the word queer, some derogatory words that maybe we should probably never actually hear again ever, but make peace with that as you will, as well as the differences between sex, sexuality, and gender, and how all three of those intertwine to create the identities that are experienced within LGBTQ. And she was very, very um, influential in making sure that we discussed transgender folks in, uh, uh, in a way that reflects the, the work that she's been doing with the communities for the past 30 years. Thank you. You're welcome. And you can also ask questions about any of the other folks as well. It doesn't just have to be about the exhibition. Just to throw that out there. Because I, I actually have a question for Adrian and Slavin. I'm just going to do that because I can. Um, because I think that their work is great, and I love it. And not only are the images beautiful, but um, for me, when I first saw it, I remember I was at it was called this exhibition at the Pacific Photo Center Northwest. And I'd already seen their Tumblr. And I was like, what's Tumblr? I'm too old, apparently. <laughs> Who knew? Who knew I was too old for Tumblr? And so I saw this, I was like, what is going on here? And then I went and I met these two there, and from the second that I met them and the second that I saw the zine, I knew, I had this feeling that they, they just n were doing something really important, and I've always wondered how you go about picking the people that make it into your zine, because that's the same topic that we were talking about with the exhibition, with the history project, is how do you pick these folks, and how, because to me, when you look at the zine, it's so diverse. You have all the body types represented. You have a variety of um, backgrounds represented. It seems that there's a variety of locations in, in neighborhoods around Seattle that I can identify myself. So I'm just wondering if you could talk a little bit about how that, that came to be. Sure. Um, people always ask us that question, uh, and it's a secret, so. <laughs> Shut down. <laughs> Well, fair. No, fine, it, fine. It's, it's really hard to explain. Um, <laughs> We have, we've been working together on various projects for a really long time. We're really good friends. Um, we have some sort of weird symbiotic psychic relationship sometimes that is pretty rad um, where Adrian will suggest somebody and I'll be like, I was thinking that too. Um, so we, w at the beginning it was a little bit easier. Uh, we just kind of wanted to uh, approach people who had t had their picture taken in the photo booth at Lick because that's kind of a thing that happens at, at every Lick um, and queers never tire of getting their photo taken. Um, so some of the people we had seen a lot at Lick and we knew they were activists or performers in some way or, or had a really interesting sense of style so we wanted to approach them. Um, so that's kind of how it started. Uh, do, you, do you have? Sure, yeah. okay. Uh, the other thing that when it started we decided together that we weren't going to include people we were close friends with. So we didn't want it to be like, hey, I'm Adrian, this is Laven, here are our friends. Um, and that actually ended up being a really positive experience because we met, I feel like almost exclusively everyone that we photographed, we got to meet and get to know in a really wonderful way and um, expand our own personal communities and relationships that felt really powerful. So as we kind of, as things progressed, we've made some exceptions for various reasons, but for the most part, it, it really felt like a way to get to know people, to share community, to share our experiences, and then end up with these images. Yes, and they're on chat. Oh. So the clay, yeah, it, it's, it, I'm going to repeat, the, oh, do you want to repeat the question? I mean, I, either one of us can do it. I mean, um, I'll do it just for the sake of content so that you can have an earlier, some time to think of your response. So the question at the table is um, that the, one of the visitors saw a picture of a man in a fedora, a fedora and um, another w person in a dress and was wondering about how these folks within the images themselves identify within this, the com the large and diverse LGBTQ community. 
I, I think that's exactly the point. I, I, you know, it's it's a it's a lot of different kinds of people, and and um, it, it it gives a chance to sort of think about what queerness means. I mean, I can barely think of how to identify myself, so I think it's it's kind of a, a neat mind uh, exercise to think about that. Uh, do you? Uh, I agree. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, who knows? <laughs> I, I like you, so yeah, I'm, I'm, I want to confound you. I think we're, we're going to be fast friends. <laughs> yeah. So also for you two, um, you said that Seattle has emerged as a character in the images. Was that the intent from the beginning? And if not, how did that happen? And how does that inform the ongoing project? Is it kind of more central part of the agenda than it used to be, or what? Uh, um, Oh, you, I don't have to repeat the question because you talked in the microphone. Good. Do you want to read? No, that's, okay. that's effective. Um, so it didn't start, as Seattle didn't start um, as a character, although since we live here, the images just happen to be here. Um, and we've taken photos in Portland and in New York, and while I actually love those photos, they don't, for me, they feel like outliers, and maybe that's because we were there, so I know I was standing in New York City, but Seattle is really... Um, become a character, and I think that's because it's it's the backdrop of everything. And we ask everyone in the project, "Hey, what what do you want to do? What is meaningful for you?" And lots of people choose their living room or their kitchen, but lots of people want to go to Volunteer Park or have the Space Needle in the background and things like that. Um, I grew up in Seattle um, and went to high school in Seattle and everything. So for me, it was it, it was a real rediscovery of the city that I felt like when I was 16 and first coming out, and I'd go to Broadway and there was the Pink Zone and stuff like that. So I hope that you know, going to the Wild Rose and taking photos will be really meaningful. Um, and, and I think it does create a theme. Excellent. Well, we've come to the end of our time for this evening, but I know that I can offer myself up after for any additional questions or conversations you might want to have and um, navigate with the rest of the folks as they see fit. But thank you so much for coming. Thank you so much for your questions and for listening. Thank you, KCTS, Mohai, Seattle Public Library, Number One Must Have, and everyone else in here in the Northwest Lesbian Gay History Museum Project. Thank you.